Well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Becky Zornick and I am the acting deputy director of the policy lab. And I am so happy that everyone can join both online and as I hear in the room as well. Uh, when I got Sonia's email, I thought, oh gosh, do I need, <laughs> should I drive to the office now? Um, so I'm a little jealous I'm not in the room with all of you. Um, but then thank you also Dr. Delphin Rittman for agreeing to do this Ask Me Anything for Public Service Awareness Week. Um, so as a lot of you are probably aware, Ask Me Anything um, is a forum concept that's relative, it's a relatively recent phenomenon. Um, existing mainly on online forums and message boards, um, such as Reddit, but we're lucky that we get to do this live. Um, so um, just, you know, SAMHSA staff have been sending in questions that we will be um, fielding through. Um, and then I've also thrown in a few there, but then we are also accepting new questions through the chat. So anyone listening, you're welcome to contribute some more questions. Um, so I thought that we could just dive in. I'll start with some lighter ones and then we'll have some more work related. Becky, um, yes. Becky, for one second. So I did just change for Miriam's sake. I changed us to gallery view here because the more faces we can see the better. So I really want to encourage folks to put their cameras on because I think that Miriam would really love the opportunity to see everybody. Um, or, or as many, and we can all see each other. And if you don't feel comfortable, I understand, but I just did want to give people that opportunity because I know how happy it makes Dr. <laughs> Delvin Rittman when she can see the faces. Yes. All right, I'll turn it to, back to you, Becky, thanks. Sure. Yeah, no, and then I feel less alone in this, <laughs> in this uh, platform. So um, let's just dive in. Um, oh, and I also threw in some uh, kind of speed fire would you rathers in there too. So we're going to keep this fun, but also informative. Um, so let's start off. What is your favorite place in the world? Yeah, you know, this is this is such a good question, and it's a hard one <laughs> um, because you know, actually, I love to travel, uh, and have done a bit of travel. So I love like the Caribbean. Love being like anywhere where there's sand and water, and but then also have traveled to to West Africa and really feel drawn to uh, some of the countries I've been there: Ghana, Gambia, Senegal. Um, but interestingly, I think one of my favorite places to be actually is in my RV. <laughs> um, ideally, like close to some body of water. And, uh, and we're just thrilled that I uh, actually opened it last weekend and uh, had to dewinterize it. And often that's where I spend my weekends, probably every other weekend or so. Uh, it's literally like right along the river. My husband and I have kayaks and we can like drag the kayaks down into the river and just go kayaking. And it's a flat water river. Like I don't do rapids or anything. That's like, that. that it's about self-preservation at this point. <laughs> so rapids are just not my thing, <laughs> but this is like a flat water river. And uh, so that's probably my favorite place to be uh, like in the camper uh, or in the kayak on a river. Um, I see a future blog series of where's our assistant secretary in her RV and, you know, pictures. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, a, quick story, a quick story real quick. So when I got confirmed, I got confirmed June 25th, but, but it, the confirmation came in early. It literally came in like two or three weeks early and we already had a trip planned. Um, so I got confirmed. I was here for about three days and then went to, took, we took the RV up to Maine, uh, Katia National Park. Uh, and I was there for about uh, about 10 days with, though, my government computer, which came <laughs> which came probably three days after my confirmation. So uh, so Maine is one of our favorite places to take it. Oh, that's great. OK, do you play any um, did you play or do you play um, any sports growing up or now? Yeah, so um, so sports, I used to do softball. I, I played that for a little bit, but uh, but that really wasn't my thing. I, I got clunked. I was in the I think right or left field, one of, one of the outfields, and got clunked several times, <laughs> and decided at that point I should probably just stick to track. <laughs> Although I still played, I love the just the team part of of softball. Um, but I ran track actually second grade through college, and and that really was my thing. I, I just loved um, traveling with the team and sort of being on a relay team and just the competition, meeting with other schools and and competing and stuff. So. Uh, so I ran track again, second grade through college and was uh, middle distance because I wasn't quite fast enough to be like a sprinter, a sprinter, sprinter, but then could work my way up, but fast enough where I could like develop the um, endurance uh, and do middle distance and distance. 
Um, so this one you might have to think about for a second. What incredibly common thing have you never done? <laughs> it's a hard one. Um, all right, let me think. Um, incredibly common thing. You know what? I mean, one thing that's common that as much as I like the beaches, I haven't done a lot is I'm not a great swimmer. I mean, like I, I can, if I'm in a situation in my kayak, I can make it to the bank, <laughs> but I'm not a great swimmer. So I've never really swum or swam or swam, whatever, underwater in a pool for like uh, any, any good bit of distance, like underwater swimming in a pool. Cause I just didn't, we wasn't around pools a whole lot. Um, in addition to, they creates a hair situation. <laughs> 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 the yeah, you know, I'm just, I'm just keeping it, it creates a hair situation. <laughs> and so, um, so not so much with the pools. <laughs> um, who is the most interesting or one of the most interesting um, people you've ever met or and talked with? Yeah, this is a hard, this is a hard one. Um, I mean, I do have, I did recently meet someone unexpectedly um, at an airport and, and got to have a little conversation. Um, so, so I actually love like CNN. There was a period of time I was glued to CNN, would watch it like all the time. <laughs> and, uh, and I and love Wolf, Wolf Blitzer. Like the Situation Room is, is you know, that, that was off of my show. Recently, I haven't been watching it as much recently just because I have felt the need to just to take a break from the news <laughs> because it's often, uh, it's just rough these days. Uh, but probably two or three months ago, I was in the airport and I'm in line at this place getting a bottle of water and the line was long. And I see this guy come in. I'm like, that is totally Wolf Blitzer. <laughs> that is totally Wolf Blitzer. And so I'm just watching him and he, he picks up a banana and then he looks at the line and I see him shake his head, put the banana down and leave. I'm like, I'm about three, three people away from the register. I can get him a banana. <laughs> And I totally did. I got him the banana and then I found him, which, which was, I, I didn't, I, I didn't stalk find him. But it was, it, no. That is some fangirling. You know what? There was a gate right there and I, and he just happened to be there. So I said, you know what? Let me go up to him. I said, you know, I saw you pick up the banana and I was right online. And so here, here's a banana. And by the way, I think you do an amazing job and like have watched you for years. And uh, he's, he was, he said, oh my God, this is so kind. And then his wife said, um, no, he said, do you want a picture? And uh, his wife said, well, how do you know he, she, uh, or how do you know that she's going to want a picture? I said, oh no, she wants a picture. <laughs> she, she wants a picture. <laughs> And yeah, so we talked a little bit. We spoke a little bit, and I totally have a picture with Wolf Blitzer with my bottle of water and his banana. And and I figure at some point if we need to call in a wild card, like something that we really. <laughs> I have the picture, so so that was my um, unexpected uh, meeting with a person who I just admire his work. So. Um, so now these are some of the questions that were submitted by SAMHSA staff. Um, as a young person who um, has begun their career in the government, do you have any advice to someone who hopes to work their entire career in the government? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the first thing I would say is I, I think that, you know, for one, just uh, whoever's question that was, thank you for that vision, that vision around service and wanting to give back and wanting to contribute. Because um, I think working in government, absolutely, it, it absolutely is about um, sort of contributing and um, being part of this, this sort of public service engine, if you will, that is about just making the lives of, whether it's at the state level, folks within that state, or if it's at a national level, folks across the country, making lives better related to whatever the area is. Um, so I would say just follow your passions, like whatever, whatever really is, and I know that sounds like such a cliche, but I would say like really follow it and drive it home. Um, if there are things that you're passionate about and, and that really, you know, those things that um, make the work feel not like work. Um, and so, um, and, and push those things and be, be creative and bold and, and all that about those things. Um, I think some, for me in my career, some of my early work 
um, was around bringing forward unsolicited grant proposals for the state of Connecticut. I loved the unsolicited proposal because my thought was any good idea, if the idea is good enough, somebody is going to fund it. <laughs> um, so, so I would say whether it's at uh, here at SAMHSA or elsewhere, if you have ideas, bring them forward. Um, because sometimes those are the very things that, that sort of create major innovation and change um, and, uh, and, and contributions to the work. Um, so I'd say, you know, just lean into your passions uh, in terms of all of what that means for you and what that passion is. Of all the SAMHSA Strong projects you have heard about, are there any that you're really excited about? And if so, which ones? Um, I know, you know, because there's so many good ones. I mean, I think the one that I'm excited about that, that actually I attended the, the CrossCut panel yesterday. Um, and so it was wonderful to hear. I was on for, for just for really just about the whole thing. Um, and the thing that struck me, and I don't remember who said it, but one, at one point somebody said that um, they love being on the panel because the panel is a mix of uh, or the, um, the CrossCut work group because it's a mixture of people that are uh, in some ways at SMEs, as well as others that may just be interested in the topic area or interested in the content. And they're coming together uh, to talk about whatever that area is. Um, and my thought was that is, for us, that's the best case scenario, right? To have just that diverse, um, diverse mix of folks coming together um, to talk about this particular area. So I'm excited about that and all that's gonna come out of the cross cuts. Um, I'm also excited about the you know, we're, we're about to embark in a budget process. And so, you know, we, we brought this up yesterday a little bit during the ELT meeting. One of the things that we'll be asking is for the cross cuts to put forward one idea, one idea that they think would be a valuable budget, um, you know, they, that they would wanna be, have considered for the budget. Um, and so I'm excited about that, just to see sort of what comes forward there. Um, and of course, you know, we'll have to think about feasibility and is it, you know, timing and how it fits with the overall things that are being proposed. Um, but just that alone, I think is really exciting in terms of um, different ideas that, that may come forward. And then one last one, I love the, um, I think the no meeting zone is a good one. I know you only asked for one, but I'm, I'm an Aries and we don't follow directions <laughs> too well anyway. Um, I love the no meeting zone. And so uh, Trina and others who, who brought that forward and put that, uh, raise that up. I think that is a, just a, a really important idea. It's a good idea. It's an idea that allows us to take care of ourselves in terms of self-care and um, and then lastly, the message board, I thought was a really good one too. I like the message board. Great. Um, so this question, um, the writer said, quote, I would be very nervous testifying in front of Congress. What do you do to prepare and calm your nerves? Okay, that, that's a good question. I can say for the record, I am often nervous as well. <laughs> um, I'm often nervous as well, but, um, but you know, I often lean into that. I, I lean into the nerves and, and uh, I often did that in track as well. When I was running, I was often like before, before a race, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm either going to pass out or, uh, you know, <laughs> um, or I'm going to win. Uh, and so often it was about, you know, I love just channeling that, you know, that anxiety uh, and, and making it work for me. And it often did. I was actually, I think a couple of my records might still stand in my high school. I think one recently fell. I'm like, oh but it, it's all good. The kids now, are, they're bigger and stronger than we were. I think there's something, it's the hormones and things in the food perhaps. <laughs> but, um, but, but seriously, I, I think the thing that helps me the most is the preparation. You know, like the, the preparation is for real. It's, you know, we go through moot sessions. So I usually get a binder that has, um, and I did this through my confirmation process. In fact, Trina and Sonia was part of that, were part of that as well. And Trina was always great at staying in character. And you, you were several of the senators uh, would often stay in character, but, but it's helpful to sort of have these um, practice sessions with a binder where the questions are, are sort of laid out and then to really go through um, in character uh, answering different questions. I think that often helps. Um, and then the other thing is often just being over prepared. Like I want to big, I want to be able to the, the few nights before have a big binder, <laughs> a big binder that I have my tabs in and color coded with, you know, to, to be able to feel over prepared. That that often helps as well. Did you do public speaking in school at all? Or was that more you had to learn how to do that as you got into your career? 
Um, I did not do public speaking in school. I probably should have because it's something I still work at every day. I, I know my, <laughs> I often say, I know my strengths, I know my limitations. Um, that is not necessarily a strength, but it's something that I, that I work at every day and that I would say I have a, not a love-hate relationship with because I still always will have those nerves. It's just part of how I'm wired. <laughs> um, I will still always have nerves, but then I like leaning into it and just embracing it. You know what, they, they're there feel the fear, do it anyway, and just keep it moving. Just keep it moving. So um, yeah. um, so this next question is, in regards to um, opioid use and stimulant use disorders, what are the harm reduction strategies you foresee SAMHSA supporting? Um, and then it says SAMHSA has recently approved the purchase of fentanyl strips and some materials and safe smoking kits, but are there other strategies that are being considered? Yeah. Um, so in terms of harm reduction, I mean, there's, there's, you know, we actually have that NOFO that is, we're in the process of reviewing, we'll probably be making those awards really soon, in fact. Um, the fentanyl test strips and the be, being able to test substances, I think right now is so critical. I would say that is, uh, in terms of all the different strategies, one of our strategies that right now is, is important because, unfortunately, we're finding fentanyl in, in everything. It's, it's in marijuana. Um, there have been states that have reported, uh, un unfortunately, overdoses from uh, marijuana, from vaping products. Um, so the fentanyl test strips, I think, are really important. Um, you know, I think the other thing, uh, um, information and resources related to uh, safe sex, I think that's often an, also an important harm reduction strategy um, and one that we support and that grantees can use our federal funds. Uh, to be able to uh, support uh, safe sex related practices and information dissemination. Um, and, and we're open. I mean, it, you know, I think the, the big thing for us is like, what does the evidence say? I think another area we're looking at right now is the, um, the uh, contingency management. And so there's a lot of advocacy around sort of what the, the uh, reimbursement rates are or the, the payment rates are related to contingency management. So that's an additional area that we support. Um, and then we're not there yet, but there's also a lot of discussion, really, and I'm, I'm sure folks have heard this in terms of the safe consumption sites, and, and uh, that's an area that, that really keeps coming up, and, and uh, you know, we're, we're definitely looking at the literature and information there. And th there's litigation there as well, so it makes, it, it makes it an area that's difficult for us to talk about in detail, uh, but certainly an area that uh, we have, we understand there's a lot of advocacy around that. Um, so this um, person wrote in, I heard about 988 during the State of the Union address, but can you tell us more about it? How will it work? Does it replace 911 for mental health emergencies? Will mental health experts be responding on scene or will it still be law enforcement? And then they added that 988 sounds like an amazing breakthrough and it's, it, I'm excited to hear more. Yeah. No, that, you know, it truly is an amazing breakthrough. It, it really is because I think um, different from how we respond to crisis now, 988 will truly allow for an opportunity for a person to um, speak to somebody live, um, ultimately connect with a, a crisis support person, you know, if that's needed. Like, this is a long range vision. I mean, there's, there's stages um, and, and I'll talk about the stages first. The first stage is, you know, really developing strong call centers, call centers where people can call, um, speak to a person uh, if they're in a crisis, uh, and ultimately be triaged to either a uh, mobile crisis will, will go to connect with them, um, and ultimately they'll be connected to other services and supports, perhaps receiving centers uh, or some other you know, community support, depending upon what their needs are. Um, and so all of that, that full continuum, ultimately can help to reduce the need and reduce the connection with uh, emergency departments uh, or law enforcement, uh, so it's, it's truly transformative in, in how we think about uh, crisis care and, and suicide prevention. Um, so we're excited about it. It, it is, it is a, um, it's a huge endeavor for one. I mean, the states are, uh, and we have about two months left, but the states are, are just all in on this and, um, and doing a really good job. In fact, um, we're already seeing answer rates and call rates go up in terms of the, uh, the crisis call centers. Um, and there'll be an opportunity for text and chat as well. So that's the other thing that's really cool. There's text and chat um, that's part of this as well. 
And if I might add, um, any staff can go to samhsa.gov slash 988, and there's a really helpful fact sheet that can answer a lot of your questions as well. Um, yeah. If I can, I'll just add one last piece. The, the 988 team, and, and this is one, you know, we often say that this, this work is, a, in many ways, many different departments within HHS are connected to this, uh, as well as in some instances outside HHS. Um, but I can say within SAMHSA, I, I just have to so commend like the 988 team and all the different parts of SAMHSA, which really is all of SAMHSA, <laughs> um, that are connected to this work because it's, it is so layered from a communication perspective um, in terms of you know, putting together convenings across multiple states and stakeholders. Uh, so it's, it's really a, um, a huge endeavor, endeavor, but one that we're, we're on the home stretch and, and we're excited about. So thank you everyone that's part of it. Um, okay, this next question asks, um, why can't SAMHSA support GS-15 nine supervisory positions, especially for those staff that are supporting interagency agreement procurements that are willing to sign off to support this position and who is responsible for funding other subordinate SAMHSA staff positions? Um, so I actually had to touch base with Amto about this one. So. Um, so my understanding is that that on a you know person by person or case by case basis, the the GS fifteen supervisory positions um, are and can be supported. Uh, non supervisory, I think supervisory as well. Both, I think both, but um, but again, it's on a, a person by person basis and uh, based on um you know omto will manage those those sort of nuances and components but there it is possible to to have uh to have that let me check because i took i the, i have some notes on this because I, I really wanted to be sure um oh actually no we do support yes gs15 non-supervisory positions so non-supervisory positions um and then of course supervisory positions uh, that as well i have one more um kind of of these harder questions, then we'll, we'll get it light again. We'll get it fun again. <laughs> um, so this person asks, what keeps you up at night? And what they mean by that is, what is the most critical issue that's facing uh, SAMHSA? Yeah, um, you know, I mean, I think when we, I think that the, I would say our, our, our challenging issues right now are, you know, the, our overdose rates, they're heartbreaking. You know, they continue to increase. Um, they continue to increase. And with fentanyl now um, being part of well over 50% of the overdoses that we see each year, um, I won't say it keeps me up, but it's something that absolutely with a sense of urgency and, and, and it is a priority for us in terms of um, being able to address and uh, come up with, with meaningful strategies and approaches uh, to addressing the crisis. And in so many ways, that's what the, the HHS overdose prevention strategy, what that work was about. Um, that's work that spanned, you know, not just SAMHSA, but across HHS, many different departments were part of that. There's four different components. And so that's, I think, an important area um, of work that represents, I would say, one of, one of our more challenging areas. I think the other challenging area that is right up there is also, uh, you know, looking at suicide prevention. Uh, suicide, unfortunately, you know, we're seeing, uh, I think every 11 minutes or so, uh, we're seeing suicides across the country. And I think that is a, um, remains a challenging area as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, can folks hear okay? Yeah, okay. Um, so one that just came in recently, uh, what book are you currently reading? Um, and what is a book that you would recommend for others? <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. You know what? Unfortunately, I mean, I a book that I started and and I'm just gonna say I started it last summer. <laughs> um, but I, it occurred to me that recently that I, I need to just download it because I could probably finish it off on just one drive from Connecticut to to you know Maryland. Um, mm -hmm. But it's the president is missing um, by Bill Clinton and uh, what is his name? Um, it's by, oh, he's a, one of the suspense writers and I'm totally blocking on his name right now, but it's really, really good. The, the part, but the part that I read, I'm about halfway through and just oh, that I have James it. Patterson. Yeah, James Patterson. That's it. James Patterson. Um, it's really good. It's really good. It's, I, I won't say too much, but it's a suspense 
sort of thriller and and the president does come up missing in it and uh and there's this whole thing around sort of cybersecurity and and sort of what drives that um and and part of the, what drew me to the book actually is on the cover um you know i think bill Qu bill clinton's quote was um this is a book that only a president could help to write because there are you know, there's information in there that's not, you know, not not top secret or anything, but just nuance related to the presidency and the work that that they added into the book. So is that one you're you would recommend, or is there another book you want to recommend to others? Yeah, I I would in terms of one that I'm reading that I would recommend that one. Um, and then the other one I have on, I do have this one on uh, on video or not on video on what is it? Uh, audio. Yeah, audio is like Amazon. I think there's like that Amazon Prime book, book thing that I'm a part of. Um, it's the one uh, Becoming, Michelle Obama's book Becoming. And I did start to listen to that one. That one's really good. It's really good. And if you, the audio version, it's actually narrated by Michelle Obama as well. So I would recommend that one. Yeah. Um, what is your favorite celebrity? Who is your favorite celebrity or influencer with a mental health platform or message? That's good. That's good. Um, you know, I actually, I appreciate, uh, you know, just the, some of the recent folks that have talked about mental health. So Simone Biles, um, also the swimmer, uh, he's, he does talk space. Yeah. Michael Phelps, I think, uh, just has a, you know, he's been just public and out there for such a long time and has such a, um, influence and I think reach in terms of the people that, uh, that likely follow him or followed his career. Um, so I think there's a commercial now that he's even doing, I think Headspace or Talkspace or, or one of those, but I, I appreciate each of them in terms of being able to raise awareness uh, and get information out about mental health. And I think Simone Biles also, even in one of her recent um, commercials, it sounds like one of our lines that mental health is essential to health uh, that she says on one of them. And so um, so I appreciate the, the many of the athletes right now that are standing up and, and, and talking about mental health. Um, so this question just came in. Um, how will you protect equity of awards across all the centers, assuring that staff are getting appropriate awards and recognition, even when the center directors don't take the initiative to submit awards on behalf of their staff? Um, you know, it's it, the question alone is awareness building. It, it's awareness building. And so um, what the question lets lets me know is that, you know, it, this is an area that we really need to, to look at. Um, and, you know, the last part of the question that center directors, um, you know, don't necessarily submit awards or submit or, or nominate folks. Um, and so I, I've received that, you know, often there's a message within a message and the message within that message, <laughs> the meta communication there, uh, which is appreciated is, um, is around center directors acknowledging, uh, you know, acknowledging the work and, and considering uh, equity and, and really me as assistant secretary, um, you know, uh, paying attention to that, paying attention to equity uh, and paying attention to um, you know, it, from a leadership perspective, leadership acknowledging the, the good work that's happening across SAMHSA. I believe the kids call that a subtweet. Um, a sub <laughs> oh, <I love> <laughs> um, another question came in. Uh, workforce issues continue to be an issue for many of our grantees and across many clinical roles. Um, how is SAMHSA addressing shortage of clinicians um, that are available to do the work? Yeah. You know, you're right. We're, it's, this, this is brutal. Uh, workforce is a challenge just across the board. It comes up, I can't count the number of times within any given week it does. Um, I mean, SAMHSA in terms of what we can do, I think the, you know, certainly the Minority Fellowship Program um, is an area that we're continuing to, and I, certainly I have an interest in, in continuing to scale up and expand. Um, we are also, though, expanding our partnership actually with um, HRSA and with CMS. So now, um, you know, myself and Carol Johnson and uh, Chiquita, we have a regular meeting, um, you know, with our teams around areas that we can, um, that we can collaborate on together and add to, to um, advance certain areas and workforce is, is one of those areas. Um, so things like the loan repayment programs, we've even had discussions about like, are there um, are there cross operating division grants that we can think about? Or if there's an initiative that, for example, we're, we're funding, um, is there an opportunity for 
uh, CMS and HRSA to support it as well. Uh, and so from, from a resource perspective, so some, you know, braided funding across multiple operating divisions. Um, so it, it's definitely something that we're looking at. The other thing is within the BHCC, so the Behavioral Health Coordinating Council. Um, and I co-chair this with uh, Admiral Levine. We, we recently formed another work group on specifically on workforce um, because it's an area that just comes up uh, again over and over. Um, and, and across HHS, I would say all operating divisions really have equities in this. Um, so, so excited about what's going to come out of that because that, that work group, uh, I think already it's, it, I don't know if it's met yet at the work group level because we, we just formed it, but soon there'll be regular meetings and goals and priorities that they're working on. So excited about that. Um, another one that just came in, um, at what age or point in life did you decide on this career field? <laughs> that is, that's a good question. Um, my journey is rarely linear because it's the Aries. <laughs> it's the Aries. Um, the interesting thing is like in college, I was undecided practically until senior year. <laughs> and I remember, uh, you know, at one point, one of my advisors or someone saying, okay, you're, you're, you're pretty much at the time where you need to decide or else you're looking at an extra year, <laughs> an extra year. And I'm like, I'm not feeling an extra year because uh, I'm trying to keep this moving. <laughs> so I was, I was really torn between like psychology, which I loved. I had a ton of psychology classes, um, but my minor was comparative religion and mysticism. So I had a, a ton of philosophy and, um, and sort of comparative sort of philosophy and, and, and uh, religion classes. And then the other area was creative writing because I, I was interested in writing. I thought, well, I'm gonna write plays and poetry and, and sort of be an artist. And, uh, and, and that's why I initially signed up for psychology. I figured psychology is gonna help me with character development for writing my plays. <laughs> Um, but, but I got into it. I, I really got into it. In addition to that, I, you know, my dad's a psychiatrist. So I think there, there were sort of seeds planted there perhaps. Uh, so I decided in, in my last year, senior year, uh, probably entering into my senior year, junior year of college. And then I had a ton of psychology classes I had to finish off in order to graduate on, <laughs> on time since I had all these other classes. Um, so my major ended up being um, psychology and my minor was comparative religion and mysticism. So not, not linear. <laughs> um, and then after college, uh, after college, I took a year off. I took a year because I wasn't ready to go to grad school yet. And like I had a friend, my two roommates, one was a drama major, the other was a dance major. And we decided the thing that we wanted to do was to rent an apartment together in New York City um, like take a gap year, although that wasn't a term at the time. So take a gap year. Um, and I figure it'll give me more time to apply to grad school and, and all that. So we did that. And, and it was an awesome year. This, the city is, is awesome. So one of, one, that's one, probably one of my other favorite places to be. So, um, so I encourage others to, to write in, but in the meantime, I have some would you rathers. Um, I think you answered this first one already, already, but would you rather vacation in the mountains or at the beach? Mountains. Mountains, as long as there's a lake or something nearby, because we okay. the, the kayaks are always in tow. Yeah. Um, would you rather always be 10 minutes late or 20 minutes early? Oh, man, 20 minutes. Um, I'm, I'm usually not really either. I'm usually like probably a minute or two late because of the back-to-back. -back. I haven't figured out the back-to-back, -back, like one meeting ends and the other meeting begins. And then somewhere in there, I, I have to sometimes fill up my tea and use the restroom. I'm sorry, sorry if, that's, if that's TMI. <laughs> but, but, not that, you know, it's universal. It's fairly, fairly universal. So, um, so 20 minutes early wouldn't happen for me. And, but then 10 minutes late is kind of, that's kind of rough. That's, that's a little bit late. That's pretty late. I remember when I was new at SAMHSA and I used to wonder if there was a private bathroom in the administrator's office. Cause I was like, how do they ever do that? There's, it's just like, you're back to back to back. I know, I know. And the funny thing is like my Fitbit died a while ago and well, truth be told it died, but then I got a thing that was recalled because the battery might catch fire or something. Um, so I'm getting another Fitbit and I can't wait to log the steps because I'm sure just in this building alone, I hit 10,000 steps with the back and forth. So I'm excited about that. I, I might have it with me the next couple of weeks or so. 
All right. Uh, would you rather be forced to dance every time you heard music or be forced to sing along to any song you heard? <laughs> That's a good one. Um, you know, either one is okay. You, you, I mean, sometimes in the car when I'm driving from Connecticut, or, you know, e either way, if I'm not that I'm a good singer. I mean, I was in a choir once, but I'm a blender. You know, I would blend in, in terms of the, the harmony and stuff. Not, not a, um, so either one. Yeah. And dancing okay. is kind of fun too. So I'll take either. Okay, one more would you rather, and then we have a couple more, a bit, more yeah. serious questions. <laughs> would you rather be able to teleport anywhere or read minds? So is that teleport or what was the other? Teleport or read minds. Oh, read minds. Oh, that's rough. Um, <laughs> it's a, that feels intrusive. Yeah, I would rather, I, I would rather not know. <laughs> so what do they say? Ignorant. I think I would rather teleport. That would be like, how cool would that be to teleport? Oh my gosh, like Grand Canyon one day and then it could be all different, all kinds of different places. That would be, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> Okay, here's one that just came in. When faced with great challenges in your career, what are some things um, that keep you motivated? Um, some things that keep me motivated. Um, I mean, what was the first part about the challenges? When faced with great challenges. Yeah, I mean, yeah, when things get rough. Yeah, when... <laughs> You know, when they get rough, the thing that really keeps me going is that our, our work is about, you know, recovery and helping people and, and, and working with folks and from a SAMHSA perspective about the nation, um, about sort of advancing and promoting recovery. And that is, um, that is energizing. Um, and so uh, the other thing for me is I love being out and about like that. That also is energizing when we do site visits and, and get to hear about the work and hear about the ways we're making meaningful differences in people's lives at the, at the individual and often at the community level. It's not just at the individual level, but often it's at the community level as well. Um, that, is, that is really energizing as well and, and definitely. Uh oh, did we lose everyone? I'm here. <laughs> oh, I, okay, it froze for a minute there. I know, I was like, no. Um, <laughs> okay, are we, sorry, did, did you finish your answer? Okay. Um, how can we, uh, what can we do to encourage, um, sorry, people wrote this in, so I want to make sure the sentence makes sense before I read it. Uh, let's go to this one. Children's Mental Health Day is tomorrow, and I know you are having a virtual event. Can you talk about the SAMHSA priorities uh, involving children, youth, and family that you are excited about? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, it, one that I'm really excited about is the, uh, we're about to have a NOFO that's going to go out, so a notice of funding opportunity, and this one is about, um, it's about uh, social media, so we're essentially standing up a social media center of excellence, um, and I think through that, there'll be an opportunity to sort of, um, to just, to come up with recommendations, to come up with strategies, to come up with tools and resources, uh, to help to promote, uh, I would say, health and wellness through social media. Um, we know that there are all kinds of challenges that we hear about that happens through social media that contributes in some instances to um, less than optimal mental health outcomes. Uh, and so really excited about what we'll be able to, um, ways we'll be able to support uh, communities and families and, and states through that work. Uh, and then ultimately young people who are, are struggling through sense, uh, social media. Um, often when I'm here in Maryland, I have a niece at 16 and my goodness, the, you know, it, it's, it has an impact. It has often an immediate, if, if there are a series of either posts or whatever, or friends that there are things up there that uh, it, it can, uh, it has an impact. It has an impact. It can tank her, her mood in a minute around certain things. Uh, so, so I think there's a lot of important work that, that, uh, that we'll be doing there. And, and I just have to acknowledge everyone because, because this, is, this one was fast-tracked. Uh, and, you know, everyone within CMHS that, that, uh, and across SAMHSA, really, that helped to put that together and get that out to the door. I just want to thank everyone for that. I wanted to um, offer people the opportunity to also raise hands and ask questions if you actually want to ask a question out loud, but also if, um, to encourage anybody who are who's in this room who might want to ask a question because oh, yeah. you guys yes. aren't 
uh, on the screen. So if you if there's anybody here who wanted to ask a question, please feel free. All right, we'll keep going, Becky. But okay, I'm here to fill in. Go ahead and raise your hands if you guys want to, but no pressure, but total pressure. Hello. <laughs> Um, okay, so in the meantime, while people are thinking that over, um, this one just came in. Is there are, um, are there conversations happening um, regarding the possibility of making the permanent making permanent the two year COVID staff positions, uh, especially for people who uh, are teleworking from across the country? Oh, I believe there are. Right? Yeah. Um, we're we're looking at. Yeah. Go ahead. We're I think that we are looking at ways of converting. I think that's a really interesting question because no one was asked to move here if they were on a temporary position, but our policy around remote is really person by person. So if you got a remote position, if you got a COVID temp position, you were you are remote, you're not guaranteed remote if you convert. Um, that doesn't mean we can't do that, but there's no policy there. We are making all those remote decisions one person at a time. So I just want to, we are absolutely interested in finding ways for people to stay on permanently. People have made amazing contributions. And so we are creating FTEs. People will, you know, we're, we're going to do that work to try and, and leverage um, the great talent. But I just want people to understand that that's not an automatic promise of remote. You know, and some some of the some of the interest really is, you know, when I when I started, we we um, and even before, I mean, Tom and Sonia were were working at this as well. Um, that we had a number of vacancies. Um, so we some of what we're dealing with is we have a number of vacancies. In addition to the fact that our budget is, if the current budget passes, it practically triples. Um, you know, so so we're working to fill vacancies, but also increase our staffing to meet our current level of funding because we have more grants that we're working through now and more incoming, a lot more collaborations across HHS. Um, so we're, uh, I'm certainly open to exploring all possibilities to do the, um, to get us where we need to get in terms of sort of staffing up as we need to, to, to be able to do all that we're, um, all that we're doing right now. Um, so, and I, and I do have to acknowledge, I mean, I know folks are working in some instances, um, it probably, it, and what we, um, heard through some of the focus groups and stuff is that uh, that because of the reduced staffing, the workload at times is is significant and it, you know it's rough. And so I just want to um, again just acknowledge everyone's all the work um, that everyone puts in and and know that we are working to sort of staff up to get us to a place where um, where we can continue to do our work and it doesn't feel like as much for everybody, you know, for folks that are carrying like double the grant loads that they may have in, in the, you know, previously. So, so stay tuned. This, this is, this is totally a priority. Um, and it's a priority within the department. So uh, they have my confirmation. This is, this is the total truth. They have my confirmation when I was meeting with Secretary Becerra. Um, you know, this is one of the things he mentioned that, you know, he really wants me to focus on, on rebuilding and building SAMHSA. And so it has been, it has been a priority area and the secretary has his eye on it and we update on it, update on it regularly. So another question that just came in through the chat, um, it's staffing related. Um, when will staffing plans for the centers and offices be available? Um, so there, so the, we're currently reviewing the staffing plans, uh, and then, um, you know, some of the some of the challenge with the plans are that the plans are awesome, but the biggest thing is we have to make sure that we have the resources to bring in all the people, and that we have to stage it out in a way that meets meets the budget. And so that's some of the work that we're doing now. Um, but but my interest is certainly staffing us up um, to like getting us to the max of where we need to be, um, so that we can do all that we need to do uh, and and have room to to sort of be creative and think and breathe and participate in some of the other. Um, you know, all the different, I know, work groups and stuff that we have. <clears throat> um, the, the question was, when will staffing plans be available? But I'm not sure that that's ever going to be. We are now going through this process with all the center and office directors to review their proposed staffing plans, at which point that, that Miriam, Dr. Duffin will approve them. And I think what people want to know is when are we going to see these org charts? Because we've heard a lot of interest in when are we going to have 
consistent org charts across the whole agency. So our goal, my goal is to have really good org chart software <laughs> so that when we want to update an org chart, we don't need to send it out to a contractor. Um, but, but the goal will be to have good I realize I'm looking at you guys, but you can't see me. Um, uh, org charts that, for every office and center that people can go to and see what what the positions are that are there. But the plans themselves are planning documents, and I and I, I that that ne won't necessarily be something that's uh, which McCall's uh, disseminated unless people really want to see them. I don't know if that's what people really want. Yeah, and actually, my mind went right to the org charts. You know, I was thinking the staffing plans in terms of what we, you know, what the the planning and thinking is around the centers and and uh, offices in terms of staffing. Um, and so we're getting there. I mean, folks have done in, in terms of what I've seen so far, there's been a lot of work <laughs> put into those and, and, you know, and they're looking good. We're, we're just figuring out now timing and resources and all of that. But certainly the goal is to uh, be staffed up uh, staff, staffed up as, as, uh, as much as we're able to based on the resources and as much as we're, you know, in terms of bringing folks in. I mean, that's where everyone can help too. If there are folks that, that will be a good fit or that you know of, absolutely send them our way. If, if there is a, um, a job posting or listing that is out there, I, I think that, you know, in terms of informal networks, you know, we all have different connections and folks that we know, and that could probably be as effective or more effective in some ways uh, in, in terms of recruiting and bringing folks in. So certainly if you see any of those, feel free to send them far and wide uh, or uh, speak to folks that you know that would be a good fit. I'll pause it. Were there any questions in the room that, um, that I should pause for? If not, I can keep going. <laughs> Okay, um, so this this one I think uh, is interesting. How influential has your has your father as a psychiatrist been on your career path? You know, it's interesting. He, my dad. So there there are six of us. Uh, so three girls, three boys. Um, and so you know, this I don't. This may or may not be appropriate, but I'm just gonna. Hopefully, it's okay. But what we would sometimes say growing up that we were the Black Brady Bunch <laughs> uh, because there's three boys and three girls uh, across two marriages. Um, but, uh, you know, he was, he was influential, but I think in an indirect way, like his, they were, uh, both of my parents were really big on not, um, not putting pressure on us one way or another in terms of our career. Um, the, the one time I maybe felt it a little bit is when I decided I wasn't going to, like, he knew I wanted to go to grad school, but when I decided I was taking my, my year to be in New York City to rent an apartment with friends in Brooklyn, <laughs> that was the one time I heard it a little bit, but at that point, I kind of, I had a job already, so, so he was, he was fine with that. Well, small f, <laughs> small <laughs> f, he wasn't truly fine with it. I think he would have preferred that I continue on and go to grad school right away. Um, but but I think it's the I think it's some of the indirect or the the um, you know while he never influenced or said you know yes go into psychology or psychiatry um, I think just exposure um, you know he had a private practice and the private practice was was run um, well he worked during the day but then had a private practice that was connected to our house um, I don't think that this would be the case anymore, but this was like in the seventies and eighties. So this definitely wouldn't be the case these days, but it was common in the seventies and eighties to, for the private practice to be connected to the house. And so, um, and, and so one of my favorite places to be when I was, when I was younger was, I would love, I loved the library in his office. It had really cool books and, um, but it also had like, um, picture, it's where he kept, like we tra he traveled a lot, his pictures from when he traveled and my parents traveled. And so I, I think just indirectly and hearing about his work, like I remember he went to a biofeedback um, session and he learned hypnosis. And, and I was always like, what bio, what, what is that? Or hypnosis? Like, can I, can I try? Will you try to hypnotize me? <laughs> and uh, so I think indirectly he, because of his, um, his work, and then he was, we were off in the house where, because different roles he had where like half of the hospital would come over for like the parties. He would often host the parties with the hospital or, or uh, his team. He was commissioner at one point in, uh, New York has a county system. So he was commissioner and he, he often, we often hosted the parties. Um, so I think all of that had an impact. And, and ultimately, uh, as I was trying to sift through 
comparative religion and mysticism or psychology or writing, the, the psychology just stuck, it stuck. Did he try to hypnotize you not to move to New York? Was that part of the... <laughs> he didn't, but he wasn't feeling that. He was not feeling the Brooklyn with the friends after, <laughs> after his supporting four years of, um, <laughs> of uh, college. <laughs> Um, so we're getting good questions from the chat. Um, what characteristic or attribute of SAMHSA staff would you like to see more or less of? That's a good question. Um, I mean, the thing that really, the thing that excites me right now is the, just the new, the, the energy and the, um, like people are, what I'm hearing is there's, there's, there's um, healing happening. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to um, assume that there's not still challenges and more work that we have to do because I think there are challenges and there's more work that we have to do. But I think simultaneously, there's also some level of healing. I hope where people feel um, uh, interested and excited about participating in things. And so I want to see more of that. I, I love that. I think where we'll get uh, as a function of our feeling safe with each other and comfortable and. Um, you know, trusting the process and trusting that um, we're going to try to be all about SAMHSA strong, each one of those letters. Uh, um, and that's coming from an authentic place. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the, the promise and possibility of, of where we are in this moment as SAMHSA. Um, I think throughout my career, like at Yale, I, I always and because of, I think because I was a SAMHSA fellow as well through the Minority Fellowship Program, like SAMHSA was always where we went. We always went to the SAMHSA website whenever we were applying for a grant to see like, what are the priorities or how do we align? And so my, my um, vision of us is that we will continue to be all of, all of what we're about uh, because I think the states and communities um, absolutely rely on uh, the, really the life-saving work that we do. So, so I'm excited. That's a long, I'm sorry, I'm long-winded sometimes, <laughs> but I'm excited about all of that. The, the promise of this moment, the promises of, of us sort of working through this together and, and just like actualizing um, all, all of what we can be about and uh, who we are. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. And um, I, I see we have five minutes left and I want to be um, mindful about people needing to transition to their three o'clock meetings. But um, I thought this was a really nice question someone asked and a uh, good way to wrap up for public service um, awareness is if you could give a shout out to someone or several someones to thank them for their public service today, um, who, would, who would that be? Oh man, so how many folks are on the line? I think I, think I saw about 100, 100. <laughs> I saw 100 and something, right? 148? 100, yeah, 140. 140. I mean, the several someones truly would be everybody, everybody on the line, everybody in the room, um, because we all sort of make up the, the you all are the fabric of, of, of sort of who we are as SAMHSA. Every, every last little sort of send you push on an email, all the work that you do day to day is, is continuing to move us forward and continuing to help us advance our mission. Um, so I would say just thank you to everybody. And, and I truly do mean that. Um, it's, it's, uh, the work that we do is, is, it's profound. It's, it's helping people to recover. It's helping people to, um, to sort of find their way, uh, when they're struggling with mental health or substance use challenges, uh, it's preventing, uh, you know, people in some instances, uh, from experiencing some of those troubles. And so it's, it's really profound work that we're doing. And so I thank everyone for, for, you know, what we all do day to day, that's making a meaningful impact. Uh, in the lives of our family members, our friends, our community, you know, community neighbors uh, across the country. So, well, and I want to thank thank you, uh, Dr. Delphin Rittman. Um, you're bringing such a wonderful energy back to SAMHSA. You're bringing us hope and like a passion and just a vision. Um, and thank you for doing this uh, AMA. Ask me anything. I learned that you're an Aries, that you have an RV, that you're a big fan of Wolf Blitzer and that you've been driven by your passions and that hasn't been a linear journey. So I just think um, that everyone is gonna take away something really positive from this event. Um, and I also wanna take this opportunity to encourage people if you don't have a three o'clock that on hhs.gov, they are doing the um, 
uh, recognition awards and some of our colleagues here, the departmental award ceremony. And I've heard that some of our SAMHSA colleagues are being recognized. So if you're able to go see that, it's being live streamed on hhs.gov. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining and for the awesome questions. And uh, until we meet again, which hopefully will be very soon. <laughs> so, and thanks, thanks Becky, for doing such a nice job. Yes, thank you, Becky. Thank you. All right.